why you took over ownership of a distillery. How important are people for you in this process? So do you also have a look to the team which is on site in the distillery, their heart, let's say, for whiskey and how they interact with the product? I mean, yeah, big question. This is absolutely great question. When we took over, um, we were we were in the fortunate position of not having we are not we were not obligated to take any of the sheriff's employees. That wasn't to say they weren't good guys because some of them were good guys, but they were being paid so handsomely that it was impossible for them to commit to come with us. So in the post, I mean, I've managed to, a lot of the guys who have been me with me have come to to join the team, and uh, so they know who I am. I know who they are, and the journey is all about achieving the ultimate, the best, making the best possible whiskey. So that, yeah, the people are... The, the people matter in this process? Totally, say. totally. Okay. They are absolutely critical. Because in I fact, yeah. they're more important to me than I am to them. Yeah. Um, just, just one sentence to that one. Uh, if you speak to the people in the distillery, they keep on telling you that they are not working for Glen Ellicke, they are working for Billy. Yeah. So that gives you an idea um, how the team is working for them, you know, it's just, just the to give you an idea. The problem is I can die. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they have to work for my son and God help them. <laughs> <laughs> Was it the purpose that the letter of your name reminds of an American, I think a Marvel story or something like this? You, you, you know what I mean, Flintstones for sure, yeah. This is a very sensitive subject for me because the, the, the kind of, the kind of uh, Cyrillic printing on here would not have been my choice. Okay. It, it was the, the marketing people. But you know what? If you employ if you employ marketing people, you have to accept that perhaps they don't get it. Well, they do get it. But, um, but it would not have been my choice. I would have been a much more conservative kind of normal. It's not my first idea when I saw the letters. Thank you for reminding me how wrong we got. Agreed. The thing is, um, it's Flintstones probably because uh, Glenallachy means. Thank you, Sebastian. Sorry. <laughs> so That's why I got told in the distillery. Eh? <laughs> do we want to move to the 15 year old? Yes, please. Look, I think this is, a, is already in, in, in a very, very nice place, this particular expression. The, the makeup of this is similar to the 12 year old, it's 65% PX. 25% um, Oroso and 10% uh, uh, Appalachian Virgin. I'm sorry? More or less, yeah. And uh, look, I have to say, I have to put my cards on the table, and uh, I'm a huge advocate of age matters. There is no, there, there are no shortcuts to quality. And you know you, you can be persuaded by as many marketing gurus as you like, but the reality is that uh, the journey to quality does take time, and, it, and there's many other aspects and elements along the way, not the least of which is the quality of the wood that, that you use. But age does matter, and I think 15-year-old is just about maybe the best of the ages. It's, in my opinion, right now for when I'm here, this is a jewel on the crown. But you still have the, um, let's say, the individual character <coughs> from the distillery. Yes. Thing, right? If it, is, if it lasts too long in the barrel, then maybe it's gone away. And well, I mean, what not we, completely, but... What, 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 what we do is, we, we, if that were to happen, we would take it out of one cast and put it into a different style of cast and slow it down. Um, and there are many, you know, it's not always about, once you've got to a particular quality in the whiskey, it does make quite a lot of sense to slow things down a wee bit. Um, and we might take it from a fresh cask and put it into a second or a third fill, just to allow the process to continue, but not to overcook. And, you know, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the blender's call. And he should be on top of that. I mean, so what you're looking here is the same, the same delivery, maybe richer, uh, more substantial, 
you're going to be, you will definitely find things that's spicy. You're going to find some uh, dark chocolate, some Christmas cake, raisins, sultanas, orange peel. There's definitely some interesting orange peel in here. And we have a thing called uh, rose hips. And right at, right at the back of the finish, you might get just a little hint of a bitter note. It's kind of eucalyptus. <clears throat> and just while we're talking, um, you'll notice that both of these are at 46%. Um, and, and that's about, so we don't need to chill. Um, we don't need to chill filter um, to, to achieve brightness. It also gives us a confidence that if you put the whiskey in the fridge, you won't get any sedimentation. If we went to 48, we'd get even better comfort. Um, but all of these are they're interesting. It's a good drinking strength. And once we come on to the single casks, we've chosen casks that you can drink at 55 or 56. Um, and we had this conversation last night. I'm not saying don't add water, but don't add water. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying don't add ice, but definitely don't add ice. <laughs> <laughs> What's the general feeling about this one? Very nice. Good. You like it? Yeah. Very nice. The best one. Well, I, I'm not allowed to say that, but yeah, you're right. Well, that was simple. The answer. Yeah. yeah. You guys think? Yeah. That's a good question. This, this young man's asked a very interesting question. We we would we would still we would the question the question was if we looked at this in five five years time would we be looking at the same formula the answer to that is maybe yes but we wouldn't have we wouldn't have whiskey and virgin wood for more than two years then you're definitely overcooking it you would have far too much butterscotch far too much vanilla and that's that's kind of that's the, that's the knowledge that you would stop it after that, you would arrest it and put it into a second fill cask or an alternative cask, maybe into another sherry cask. But you can overcook virgin and I don't know if you follow me on Facebook, we, we, we are playing around with an oak called chinkapin. Um, it's a, a Missouri oak and it's hard with very, very, it's, it's very difficult to get this wood. But it gives you, it doesn't give you, it gives you some of the vanilla and butterscotch, but it gives you licorice and anise. And it's fantastic delivery, but you can overcook it. You just need to keep monitoring it. You're pulling me off in all kinds of directions here. Another direction then. How peculiar are you about your barley? And do you make sure to get it from the same terroir every time? or We get it from Scotland. Um, okay, so and we always? Get always, northeast of Scotland. Um, we don't have our own maltings, but we use uh, we use the Pro Gordon maltings, which and they guarantee we only ever have uh, um, malty barley. But it's a great question, and, and it you may not understand the layers that are underneath that. Uh, the question is, are we are we precious about the malty barley we use? We're kind of controlled by the, the commerciality of who who the maltsters are. The one guarantee we have is that we use we use barley that's been grown in the northeast of Scotland. Um, 
But I can remember, I can, I can remember 30 years ago when we were using Golden Promise, a typical yield, that would, alcohol yield would be about 400. And today the alcohol yield is 435. There's something, there's something not right about that uh, equation. Uh, we really don't drive for yields. We're constantly driving for quality. Um, so we're looking at things like going back to more golden promise derivatives um, and seeing what that geometry takes us. And that's why we're also looking at perhaps top guessing the yeasts to see if that gives us any kind of additional delivery. But you know, we're very aware that we can't be sucked into just chasing low cost spirit. It's not, it's, not a, it's not our bundle, it's not our game. Our game is quality. We don't care if we drop the yield by 10%. It doesn't matter. We want it to be right. And, um, and the malted barley is a very important part of it, unquestionably. And I think the, the, the boutique side of the industry is intent on, on retracing our steps and looking at some of the, the varietals, the, the, the barley varietals, that we worked with maybe 10, 15, 20, 40 years ago. Have we, um, the taste of the Dubai changed when you elongated the uh, brewing periods? Yes. So considerable? Or? We think it's more balanced. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not finished there. We're also going to have a look at uh, um, are we taking the right cut? Uh, is the right in the middle cut right? And we're going to do an experiment um, in February of next year where we will extend the cut we take to see if taking some more of the higher alcohols into the, into the body of the spirit will change anything. We, we, we don't think so, but we're going to try it anyway. <laughs> and the yeast, they have already uh, made some experiments with the yeast? No, that'll be, that'll be in January. Okay. We're putting a new yeast plant in, in, yeah, in January and that will give us an opportunity to be much more flexible in, in what we do. So like a prosthetic, you want to try a natural yeast? Or? Listen, I'm not convinced totally about natural yeast because it's too unpredictable. Yeah. Um, we do think that the yeast we're using has to be properly controlled. Um, we think there's enough natural yeast about the place anyway. Um, but but we, we, we need to be sure that, uh, that what, what we're bringing into the system is not going to upset the, the kind of the, the bio balance of what we're doing. But it is important, it's important. It's, and maybe we have been too, too presumptuous about having a common source of yeast. I mean, when I, was, when I worked at Ballantyne's, we bought our own yeast and and it, that was difficult because you get some, I mean, horrific failures. And, you know, you've got this big plant to support and you've got no yeast to, to, to use. Um, and you needed quite a big technical team to, to do your own yeast. So whatever we use, we, we currently use liquid yeast and the top dressing will be dry yeast, but it will be from the kind of sources we're talking about, like uh, Burgundy wine or Champagne or, or that kind of stuff. So, Yeast is important, fermentation is important, copper contact is important, wood is important. Yes. That all sums up to something like magic that's unpredictable. Well, <laughs> and water is also important, yeah. an extremely important ingredient. In fact, one of the, one of, one of the great charms of uh, the location of uh, Van Alke is just, we're in one side of the mountain and when Farkless is in the other side of the mountain, but we get most of the water. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, water, water is, I mean, all of these things are important. Look, I've been asked this a million times, as a, as a chemist, is the art of making whiskey, uh, is it a science or is it an art? And I have to say, I go on the side of art. The, the science explains some things, but the art delivers the ultimate. Science makes one and one two. Art makes one and one four. <laughs> so what do you think? Okay? Great, great. Are, are you picking up the flavours that I was saying? Are we in the right territory? Because defining flavour is the most impossible thing. I mean, I could say vanilla, you might say butterscotch, heather, honey. Don't be ridiculous, it's something else. 
it's also the case that this is probably, I'm sorry to say this Tom, the worst possible time to be tasting. It's also probably not, you shouldn't be tasting after a meal because your taste, uh, your, your olfactory notes are probably dulled a little bit. That's why you shouldn't use ice, because ice anesthetise your taste buds. Um, the best time for, for a blender, we do all of our work, best work, if there, is, if there is never any best work that we do, between 9 and 11 o'clock. In the morning. In the morning. Yeah, and you're fresh, your mind's fresh, your experience is fresh. Probably, you, you, I mean, your taste buds are the best. So we do, we do a different kind, we do a different kind of tasting after nine and eleven in the evening. <laughs> we will have a special lineup for breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, we think this, in in terms of. The commerciality of it, and it is quite important. You know, we have to we have to make a product that it can engage with the consumer, and has the qualities that will take it above the hopefully the rest. We think this right now is a jewel in the crown, and we see we see Guanal here, fifteen year old, as being a significant competitor to Andromeda. Definitely. Any other thoughts? Much Are the well. German customer something special, or what? How would you characterize <laughs> oh, a German customer? Is there something outstanding? Unbelievably yeah. demanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see it here. Yeah, it's as good or bad. That's a guy. That's a joke. <laughs> Germany is a fantastic market for us because the truth is that um, this sector of whiskey. Uh, has grown in the most amazing way, and the people who are growing it are they are like yourselves. They are curious, they are <coughs> inquisitive, and they're challenging. And these are all very important. The, you know, we need to deliver for you, and you ask the right kind of questions. I mean, if this audience would never have happened 20, 30 years ago. And this is what this is what's so spectacularly interesting about single the, the single malt category, and. And it's not owned, and I, I touched on it briefly about um, Diageo and Chivas. They are so nervous about over-investing their, their time and money in, in single malt. Because if they, if they even had an inkling they could collapse Johnny Walker or Chivas, they would be in real trouble. So, thank you God. <laughs> So from that, I mean, we've seen a lot of distilleries moving from, you know, being owned by families or smaller people to all being owned by Shivas, and now we basically see a small move back. Do you think that's going to increase over the next years, that there's going to be more individual owners of distilleries again? I think it's difficult. You know, <coughs> the, the, difficulty, the difficulty is finding a distillery to buy. And the people who own them, you know, if you look at... What distilleries are in private ownership? Um, Len Farkless, um, Aaron Distillery, Bladnock, uh, Andrew, Andrew Simonton at Edward Dower, um, and, I'm sorry? That is an yeah. um, The ones that might have been available, in my opinion, and we've, we've talked about it over the last period, it's Ben Davis, very interesting distillery, but it's owned by Nika. Um, Tomato is owned by Takara, a Japanese company, they won't sell. So the, the problem is not just would, would people be able to buy it, it's difficult. And I don't think there is an enthusiasm on the part of uh, Chivas or um, the Aju to sell anything. And, and these companies, I mean, if you'll pardon the language, I'm going to swear if ladies, if you don't mind, but it's to put something in context. There's a new MD at Chivas, um, a young chap, Christoph, who, who's probably very talented. And we've brought, and we've brought something like five or six expressions to the market in about a period of film months. And he gathered this, he, and this is not making us good people, but it, it, it shows you the difference between big companies and little companies. He gathered his marketing team and said, look, how the fuck can these guys bring six products to the market in eight months and you take four years to bring one. <laughs> and therein lies the dilemma for big companies. They don't make quick decisions and sometimes they don't make any decisions. 
Did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I suspect not. I think what I will say is that it, it will be difficult. And the entry price is 12 million. Forget what you pay for it. You, you need 12 million quid to actually take the distillery at a decent level and have it maturing for a decent period of time. That maybe is the biggest barrier of all. In the end, is deciding what's what? Me? Yes. Yeah. Could be my son soon. <laughs> So are we okay with this one? Do you yes. want it? I mean, we can linger, we can talk further about it. I, I'm, I'm very precious about this one. I think this is going to be the real lead out in the team. Yeah. So what makes it, do you think the, the difference in taste between the 12 and the 15 year old is just the three years extra, or did you use more first fill cars? Or? No, that, that we, we didn't use it. The balance is the same. Um, but I made the point that, I mean, three years is. At that age, three years, is, I mean, three years is a substantial difference. And there is, there is actually chemistry in all of this. And, and if you think about it, as the strength falls in the whiskey, every year you have whiskey in the cask, it will fall by 0 0.4, 0 0.5% of alcohol. So the solution, if there's any chemist, stop me if you think this is stupid I'm talking about. This is the truth. As the strength falls, the solution characteristics of the whisky changes. So you start extracting different, uh, different flavour characteristics from the wood. And once you get down into the 50s, once you're into 15 year old, the strength will be around about 57, 58%. So the solution characteristic of the whisky is changing all the time. You're getting things that are becoming more soluble in water than in alcohol. And uh, so there is, a, I mean, there is a real logic to, the, to not only refining the whisky and smoothing it, but you're taking on board additional flavour characteristics as it's in the wood and as the whisky is becoming low, lower in strength. What flavours would those be? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I can give you a chart on this, but it, it's too complicated. But essentially, you're moving, when you put whisky into the cask, it's say, and this is also interesting. We fill sometimes at 69, and we fill sometimes at 63.5. And there is a real, in my opinion, it's not just about saving space in terms of warehousing. I think there is a real benefit in putting some of your whiskey in at the higher strength. Uh, do any of you know Stuart Buchanan? He used to work for me at, uh, at Ben Riech. He's a crazy guy, and uh, very, very... <laughs> Very talented guy, not 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 case. So we, we actually we, 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 we brought some grain in from uh, from Chivas at ninety four percent, and he decided he forgot to reduce it, and we put it into the. I mean, first of all, incredibly unsafe in terms of flammability. <laughs> <laughs> but he put it into the casket. The, the, the flavour development was unbelievable. It was fantastic. However. The losses in the cast were also fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, look, there's so many, there's so many things that contribute to the flavour, and that if you are patient and you have the opportunity to to manage them into it, it can actually deliver some smashing stuff. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, three years does matter, but it's not just the three years; it's the whole processes that are occurring in cask as a consequence of the continuing maturation period and the fact that what is going on between the liquid and the cask is changing all the time. Are there for economical reason really only 15 years old uh, cask used or also older ones uh, to get the taste uh, you want? <laughs> Such a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, um, in the long term, uh, it, it makes sense to have uh, the inventory in balance at the right age. Um, and it, it does tend to smooth out some of the problems you might have if you're using too much old. I mean, I suspect if MD here continues to be a Glendronach fan, they will find a significant difference between the 15-year-old as it was um, when we produced it 
and the 50 year old today, and you've touched on the very point, it was significantly overaged. And the, the, the problem is, when you, get to the, when you get to the break point and you start using young again, there is, there is a possibility of significant disappointment in, in, in the expression. Good